Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for this interview with the writer Lisa Soher Majash. Lisa, thank you very much for agreeing to do this interview today. Thank you for having me. My name is Petra Torna Theodotu. I am Professor of English Literature at European University Cyprus in Nicosia, Cyprus, where I teach a variety of literature courses on the English Studies programs. I'm very happy to introduce to you Lisa Soher Majash. Lisa is an American-Palestinian poet, academic, and friend who over the years has visited European University Cyprus on numerous occasions for public readings and class visits. Lisa was born in Iowa in the United States, raised in Jordan, educated in Lebanon and the US, and lived in America till 2001. When she moved to the island of Cyprus, she holds a PhD and two MA degrees from the University of Michigan. She's the author of the poetry anthology Geographies of Light, winner of the 2008 Del Sol Press Poetry Prize, and two children's books, and co-editor of three collections of critical essays. In her work, Lisa draws on her life in the Middle East, in the US, and partly in Cyprus to portray experiences set amid situations of cultural complexity and political conflict. Her writing provides avenues into the experiences of Arab Americans, both in the US and in the Middle East, introducing readers to encounters that may seem far from them, but which are extremely relevant in today's diverse world. In this interview, I will explore issues of identity and belonging with the writer. So Lisa, um, I would like to ask you to start um, by telling us a bit about your background of growing up between two cultures, the US and the Middle East. Uh, I'm wondering what it was like growing up Palestinian American. What were your early and later experiences with a dual ethnicity and possibly with race? Well, uh, in a word, it was complicated, um, very complicated. <laughs> so yeah. I was born in the States, as you said, and I, but, and I grew up in Jordan in a family context where English was the main language. My mom was American. We spoke English at home. I went to an American school. Um, in the family context, there was Arabic around me, but I never became fluent in Arabic. So language was a key element that made me to have a sort of an inside-outside space. Um, I felt American. When I was growing up, I was kind of positioned as an American. I mean, even the family considered us the Americans. Um, I, I felt a little bit set at a remove, even though I was part of the culture. I mean, I was part of my family. I mean, I was deeply embedded in my family. Um, but there was always that feeling of being a little bit outside. Um, and I was also, in the, in the Arab world, I was considered white. So there was an issue of race. Um, mm -hmm. I was considered fair, blonde even, although my hair was darker than it is now. And but um, so, and when I would walk down the street, I would attract attention oh. um, as a foreigner. Apparently, even the way I walked sort of gave it away that I was not, <laughs> not quite right. fitting in. Um, and when I went to college in Beirut, again, I felt positioned as, a, as an American. And I, because of my lack of Arabic, I didn't really have a clear sense of all the political things that swirled around me, um, to be honest. I had a personal involvement in it, but not that in-depth political involvement. And I think my father thought that I would just understand it by osmosis, and political discussions always happened in, in Arabic. Um, and then I went to the States, and literally overnight, I became Arab. <laughs> It was astonishing. Right. I mean, I just, it was like I got off the plane and I was transformed. All of a sudden, I was positioned as Arab. I could pass in, unless I, uh, until I said anything about myself. Um, I had left Beirut after four years during the war. I had had a, a lot of trauma. I had evacuated out um, on a boat that was hijacked by the Israeli military and taken to Israel for interrogation. Um, I lived in Beirut for four years, so there was a lot of bombs and things that happened while I was there. And so one of my very first experiences in Michigan was I was walking across the campus, a very calm, serene, green space with squirrels, and um, <laughs> and a car backfired, and I hit the ground. <laughs> because that instinctual response. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of like, and then I got up and I looked around and everybody was just 
walking mm -hmm. and it felt surreal I really felt like I was inhabiting a different space mm -hmm. and I was and I was also positioned as differently I was positioned as a foreigner I could keep my mouth shut but when I opened my mouth it didn't it, then it, it all changed um, and um, and also in the states how I was positioned racially was different because in the in the states Arabs are very much racialized um, mm -hmm. while in the in the Middle East people would exclaim on how blonde I was I'll never forget an American woman telling me I, you know, you certainly don't look American. You're so dark. Um, so, and I was still the same person. Right. So, yeah, yeah. Um, and the, another Arab American writer has has written about this, about you know, um, how you always feel that you're the other part wherever you are. You're always out of place. I mean, I resonate very much to Edward Said's description of of being out of place because this is what it always felt like to have these two ethnicities and these two. I, um, identities and belongings. Wherever I was, I wasn't there. I I was um, I was out of place. Right. So, right. Right. Yeah. So you always felt that you were inhabiting an in-between space um, and never yeah. really felt at home um, uh, in in one place. Yeah. Yeah. Very much so. And it was kind of accentuated, I think, because um, my parents were both exiles too. My father was an exile from. Palestine and my mother was in exile from the States and both of them missed their homelands and had this sense of longing. So we lived in Jordan and it was a kind of an in-between, out-of-place place for all of us in some sense, in some sense. Yeah, yeah. 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 So it, w it was a bit complicated. <laughs> of course, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank so, you very much. Yeah. Um, let me move to the next question then. Sure. You are a researcher and a poet. You have engaged with issues of identity, belonging, and feminism, mm -hmm. both in an academic and creative mode. Okay. Um, can you possibly talk a bit about the differences that is of you know working in an academic or in a creative uh, mode? And what made you turn to writing poetry? Okay. Um, well, I turned to writing poetry to figure out who I was. Um, but I also turned to my academic work in a way to figure out who I was. So when I went to the States, um, first I did a master's in English, and then I shifted to the program in American culture and did a master's and a PhD in American culture. And I became very interested in American ethnic literature. Um, I didn't. I hadn't really read ethnic literature in Jordan, and I remember reading Maxine Hong Kingston's *The Woman Warrior*, and it was just a revelation. It was just like, oh my goodness, here was somebody writing about having these two backgrounds and this kind of complication, um, and that spoke to me on a really deep level. And so, in one of my classes where we probably had a free topic, I decided to. I wanted to write about Arab American literature, and I remember my professor said, "Well, there isn't any." <laughs> So I thought, well, let me see. <laughs> so, I mean, I sort of got into my field in a way to, because I was a bit offended. I thought, well, I exist, you know, I mean, there must be other people and, you know, there must be some literature somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and so I came to my academic field very much out of my personal interests and to my creative work out of this, out of these um, personal issues. And actually, um, it when I when I was in the States, and I told you about feeling out of place, but at, at some point, um, okay, I, so I started this academic work in order to find out what was there and make a space for myself and see where I fit in. Um, and I was trying to figure out my identity at the same time. I went to this academic work trying to see also how other Arab American writers had talked about these issues that I was facing. I discovered I didn't quite fit in there either because I'm I wasn't an Arab American completely, like I wasn't from an Arab family who had emigrated to the States. I was mm. daughter of an American mother and a Palestinian father, and I had grown up in Jordan. And so I didn't even fit into any of the spaces that were defined as Arab American either. So then there I was again, mm -hmm. out of place. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I turned to, po well, I turned to poetry for several reasons. I've always written poetry. I've written poetry since I was a child, yeah. actually. Mm. Um, when I was in college, though, um, it, my English professor, who was very nice, showed my poetry to another professor and sent me off to talk to him. And he was in a very acerbic, a very acerbic person. Wow. And um, he said, well, you shouldn't bother to write anything until you've read everything that's been written. 
And <laughs> that was a little bit daunting for an 18-year-old. <laughs> to and say the least. So then yeah. I thought, well, I'm a fraud. I better not write. Um, <laughs> and then so when I went to graduate school, I thought, well, my academic work is the serious thing I'm supposed to be doing. And especially once I realized mm -hmm. how little visibility Arab American issues in, in general and Arab American literature in particular had, it, I took on my project um, of researching it, it, it felt like something important to do, not for me, but also for a wider community. And I found this very much when I was researching, and I would, um, there were no bibliographies at the time, we didn't even have the internet databases, but you couldn't find, any, you couldn't find Arab American as a category, you had to look in very roundabout ways um, at that time. And I would um, go to used bookstores and riffle through journals and books, and I'd, if I found an Arab-sounding name, I would write to the publisher um, mm. and ask to be put in touch with the author. Um, I would write, I wrote to a lot of Arab-American organizations and asked, you know, I, right. I wrote hundreds mm. of, of letters. Um, and every time I found a writer, they would tell me, I'm the only one. And I'd say, no, no, there's more. <laughs> <laughs> it's impossible. So, yeah. No, yeah. but everybody had a sense of being isolated. We didn't have a network or a community at that point. Mm -hmm. So part of what my right. research meant to me, it wasn't just an academic project. It mm -hmm. was um, deeply personal because mm -hmm. I felt like I was trying to figure out who I was. And I was also trying to create a space. And we were trying to make this connection. We were trying to create a, a communal space. Mm -hmm. And at some point, I, I really became tired of this feeling of being pulled in these two directions, you know, half in one direction, half in the other, half of one part, half of another. I, for a while, I had this metaphor that I had my feet on two different continents, and the continents were widening, widening and I was being, you know, split apart. That's how it felt a lot of, of the time. And it, I started writing poetry. Um, I started writing poetry in grad school. I took... Um, I took a creative writing class. It felt like a complete indulgence, but I ended up writing quite a lot about my experiences in Beirut and in Jordan of war during this class. And I remember somebody got told me, why don't you write about nice things? This is a poetry class. <laughs> but I, I, I realized that poetry could help me process the kinds of traumas that I had inside of me that I hadn't find, found any language for. Um, and then I really started writing poetry um, after my father died. My father died in 1988, and a few months before that, the first intifada had started in Palestine. And this was the first time that um, that Palestine was really, had, had visibility in the public sphere in the States. Um, when I first went to the States, it was just kind of suppressed. Nobody talked about Palestine. Um, but for the first time, a view somewhat sympathetic to Palestine was on the news, always carefully mediated. So if you had one Palestinian being interviewed, you'd have like four counter voices to make sure. But um, people were actually talking about the Intifada. And that was very powerful for me. Um, and I, when my father died, I was very traumatized. My mother had died two years earlier. And I felt, you know, orphaned and bereft. And I also... That coming together with the First Intifada made me feel that I really needed to understand Palestine. I need to, needed to understand my relationship to this legacy that my father had left me. And poetry became a way to try and sort out all of these disparate parts of my identity. I wanted to find a way to be whole that I could speak out of the wholeness of myself. And at some point I wrote a poem called um, cadence, and it came out of my sense of my, my desire to try and find a space for myself where I could be whole, and to resist being defined by by all sides, either being told I didn't belong, but also being pulled into mm -hmm. a definition. Like I remember once I gave a poetry reading, and um, somebody, an, an Arab in the audience, um, basically it didn't want to acknowledge the American part of me. I mean, I was supposed to just be Arab. Um, and in this, in an American context, the Palestinian part of me was inconvenient, so I should like silence that. And I, I wanted, um, I, I wanted a sense of wholeness. And so I'll just read you a few lines. Actually, oh, that would be wonderful. Yes, if you please. don't mind. Yes, yeah. yes. Um, it's from the poem called Cadence, um, and this is toward the end of the poem. Mm -hmm. uh, the Arab American woman knows who she is, and it's not what you think. She's authentic in jeans or in an embroidered dress. When she walks up a mountain, her identity goes up with her and comes back down again. 
Besides, she's learned a secret. Two cultures can be lighter than one if the space between them is fluid, like wind or light between two open hands, or the future, which knows how to change. And poetry gave me that space in a way. It gave me a space where I could explore um, poetry. For me, I'm a very intuitive poet. Um, I, uh, I mean, I sometimes use more direct forms, but um, I, I come at... I come at poetry from someplace deep inside of me, and I'm often surprised by what I come out with. So there's some kind of internal linkage that happens through language, and it's what I needed on a personal level, too. I needed that kind of linkage. So poetry gave me that space, and it, and it gave me a voice. It gave me a sense of agency, because I felt this responsibility to speak out about Palestine. And um, my academic work, I wasn't writing di directly about Palestine, but in my poetry, I could I could say what I felt, mm -hmm. and that felt important. Yeah, yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Thank you very much um, yeah. for elaborating on yeah, this yeah. question. Yeah. So the next question then um, is about uh, yeah again your affiliation. So what are the challenges for a writer? Um, with affiliations to two different or even conflicting cultures. Mm -hmm. um, you have partly maybe already answered this uh, question, um, but I wanted to also um, uh, refer to an essay titled On Writing and Return, Palestinian American Reflections that you published in the journal Meridians, um, where you talk about the creation of homelands of language. Um, so maybe you can expand just a little bit more on what, what you have already uh, said. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, first I'll say the challenges are great and the rewards are great too. I finally decided to just accept complexity <laughs> since it wasn't right. going to be a way out. <laughs> so, um, and complexity is great because it gives us a lot of different ways of looking at things. Um, but it, this sense of when I when I talked about homelands of language. I meant it metaphorically, and I meant it kind of literally as well. I mean, I've talked about this sense of being out of place and of being mm -hmm. an exile. And for Palestinians, this sense of being exile is also very literal. Um, I mean, for a lot of Palestinians, they can't go to Palestine. They've lost everything there. Hmm. Um, and um, it's not even sure that people with another passport can go. I have many friends who tried to go, and they were turned back at the airport because of something they posted on Facebook. Um, when I go, I never know whether I'm going to be allowed in or not. Mm. I go through, I've never been turned back yet. But, And when I used to travel with my family, I remember distinctly a time when they almost didn't let my father through. Um, so there's a sense of, for, for a Palestinian, speaking just now about the Palestinian part of it, there's a sense that there isn't a homeland. Like, it's not mm. just something that we miss. I mean, but mm -hmm. we can't get mm -hmm. access to it. It's there, but we can't get access mm -hmm. to it. Mm -hmm. And it's disappearing before our eyes. Um, and for a displaced writer, we're, and, and, and we're, we're always out of place. And maybe all writers are a little bit on the outskirts, um, inhabiting a realm mm -hmm. that isn't part mm -hmm. of the prosaic world. Nobody mm -hmm. really understands. Mm -hmm. And so maybe all writers create these homelands mm -hmm. of language. But it took yeah. on more acuity for me because mm -hmm. of these multiple dimensions of my life yeah. and because of the realities of, of yeah. Palestinian experience. Um, and I have to say that when I was a kid, um, I told you I grew up in this, you know, I, I grew up in a kind of a, of a bubble. I was a very shy kid. Um, mm -hmm. as, as I said, I wasn't fluent in Arabic, which I have, you know, I'm very chagrined about, but it there are many reasons why that happened, but I was constantly reading. My mother was the librarian at the school that I went to, uh -huh. and so we always got to read the books first. <laughs> <laughs> and um, she, and then for Christmas, she'd always like place an order through the school, and you know, I mean, we could, you know, through the through whatever means that they had to get books into the country, and I would have like a big stack of books under wow. the tree. Yeah. Um, and language and literature was where I went to feel mm -hmm. safe. I mm -hmm. could just shut out the world, and I mean, I remember. Um, I remember a cousin scolding another child in the family who was reading a book in a situation where he was supposed to be so, so social, and she said, do you want to be Elisa Majesh? <laughs> <You know? laughs> and because I would get in trouble for reading at the table and reading in all sorts of you know places where I wasn't supposed to read. Um, so literature was my first refuge, and then writing became another kind of a refuge. Um, and we can cr and and the thing about writing is that, we can create these worlds. I mean, I understand why people write science fiction, for instance, I don't. But my mother, my mother read a lot of science fiction. Oh, she created also 
a, a space for herself that was away from the reality. So right. writing gives us this chance to go mm. to someplace different, and it right. it helps us get through difficult things. I think yes, so. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Right. So thank you, Lisa. Yeah. My next question then, um, what might be the particular challenges for a woman writer, an academic? Okay. Um, in the already mentioned essay, you say that Western models of feminism do not work in other cultural contexts. Um, could you possibly comment on how this tension might have affected you as a person, as an academic and as a creative writer? Um, it, it's a kind of a complicated question. My, my comment about Western feminism came out of um, the frustration that I felt when I came to the States of how Arab culture is portrayed and how Arab women are portrayed. Now, I grew up in Jordan, and we I did deal with, with issues around gender, and I've written about them, and there are cultural constraints. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the Western notion of feminism tends to see Arab women as always already oppressed um, and things that are just part of normal life as being symbols of oppression. So I remember very distinctly mm. an issue of Ms. Magazine quite a long time ago now. They had some article about Palestinian women and I can't remember exactly what it was now, but there was some comment about, oh, and maybe one day they'll take off their scarves and be free. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and I wrote yeah. a letter um, to them, and they wrote me back a very nice letter, but they wouldn't publish my letter. Um, <laughs> basically saying, you know, a piece of fabric on the head is not what defines freedom, and you have to ask the women whether what they want to do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so in some contexts, women want to remove their, their scarves. I mean, we see this in Iran now. In other contexts, a, a scarf can be a sign of identity. It can be a sign of, uh, uh, of claiming space. We saw that in the States after 9-1-1 when a lot of Muslim women who hadn't previously worn hijab mm -hmm. put on the hijab at a time when it was actually, um, it, it exposed them to, to racism and even to danger in some cases, but they put it on because they wanted to claim who they are. So feminism, Western feminism is a kind of a blunt tool. Um, and it doesn't really understand, it doesn't respect the nuances. And grow, I grew up in Jordan and I saw that women were very powerful. Mm -hmm. um, women played a, a, a role in society, but they had a lot of power both within the family and without. And um, the women in my family, they all had, um, all, almost all of them had careers and they were very outspoken, mm -hmm. and um, so I couldn't quite put together my personal experience of what Arab women were with the stereotype that I found when I came to the States. Mm -hmm. um, and one of, the, I mean, in my in my graduate work um, and in my, my work after that, um, I've looked not only at Arab American issues, but also at issues about Arab women, um, and I've looked at Arab women's literature and translation. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say also, like, in the Arab world, I was considered too feminist, and in the States, I was considered not feminist enough. Um, <laughs> yes, my, my views didn't change, but how I was positioned mm, yeah, changed. Yeah, obviously. Uh, um, one of the things that, and so some of my academic work came out of really an attempt to address these issues of feminism, um, especially with the work I did on, on Arab, women, Arab women writers. And I also looked at it in terms of Arab American literature, because in Arab American literature, there's this complicated thing where if you're trying to hold on to ethnicity, um, and Arab American writers were indeed trying to, to not be completely assimilated, but then if you hold on to ethnicity, um, tra tradition is part of ethnicity, and traditional ro gender roles can also be caught up in that. So for instance, in some Arab, uh, in some Arab American male writers, I found a lot of um, nostalgia for patriarchy. <laughs> and so how to critique that while still holding on to um, a, a, a claim to the, this identity is actually an issue for Arab American writers. And um, uh, uh, the poet Suhair Hamad is, a, is um, a, a really good example. She has a very strong critique of, of gender issues, but she has a very strong claim to Palestine as well. Mm -hmm. But this is one of the conundrums that I was trying to deal with. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of my creative writing, um, and, and, and I, when I dealt with it in academia, um, in my academic work, that was fine. And I also want to mention that people think, oh, Arab women are oppressed. Well, 
one of the reasons I got a PhD is because my father um, insisted that I get a good education, and he wanted me to be a doctor. Um, and my mother thought medicine was not a good fit for me. She thought, she said, you know, the first time you have, you have a patient die, you'll be devastated. I don't think it's good for you, <laughs> which is yeah. true. Um, right. But so I, I did not get my PhD before my father died, but I was proud that I, that he knew I was getting it, and I knew he was mm. proud of me. And so, and I knew that also we're expected to fulfill familial roles. Well, my familial role was to, um, one of the things in, in Arab culture is whatever you do reflects on the family. So my doctorate reflected on the family mm -hmm. as well. So you could say, well, that's also another expectation of Arab women. Does that fit into the role of oppression? No, not really. Mm -hmm. In terms of my creative writing, it was a bit more difficult um, because it, with academic writing, it's a bit at a remove. With creative writing, one writes quite personally, at least yeah. I do. Um, one of the first pieces of creative nonfiction I wrote was an essay about what it meant to be Arab American for me, my sort of whole exploration with all of these issues. Um, it's called Boundaries, and it was published in an, the first anthology of Arab American feminist writing. And I had sent a draft of the essay to somebody who, without my knowledge or permission, showed it to somebody else. And this person I didn't even know called me up from California uh, to say, I love your essay. Everything you say is exactly right, and you can't publish it. <laughs> and I'm like, why not? And she said, no. She said, you're airing dirty laundry. And it's true. I talked about being harassed when I walked down the street. I talked about what it meant to be objectified as a female. I talked about these different things. And I understood, I published the essay, but I understood why she said what she said. And in fact, when I sent the book to an aunt in Palestine, um, she was a very feisty woman. I loved her a lot. She never married. She was a librarian. She traveled the world. Very strong character. Um, but she, when she wrote me back a letter and she said, thank you for the book. I have received and read it. And that's all she said. And I knew she didn't like it because I said too much that was personal, you know. Wow. So there's this issue about um, this whole issue about feminism. Mm -hmm. How do you how do you address things? Because it all gets caught up with these stereotypes of Arab women. And I found this again and again. I would go to conferences um, or I would try and write something. And to make a feminist critique of anything in Arab culture, people say, yeah, 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 we know Arab women are so oppressed. Um, and I would, I remember once I was giving a poetry reading and I read mainly poems about Palestine, about politics, about what was about the intifada, things like this. And then the then at the end of the reading, it was a question and answer period. And the first person who raised their hand asked me to kindly tell them about the oppression of women. <laughs> um, and it was like, well, I didn't even mention this, you know, would you like to ask me about something I talked about? Um, and actually, one of my edited, and I've, I've co edited three anthologies, and one of my edited anthologies, Going Global, came out of this. My co editor, Amala Mire, and I were very frustrated by this positioning, and so we put together this collect, collection of essays that looks at not only Arab women, but other women in different places, looking at how. Um, the attempt to have a feminist critique and to speak out gets contained in way, in ways that make it co commodified for the West, actually. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 So, yeah. Um, Would you say that this has changed? Um, because you were talking about 9-11, uh, so, yeah, you know, yeah. it's almost 20 years on, or do you think the perception uh, continues to be um, the same? Or? I... You know, I've been out of the States for a long time now, and so my, my reference point that I'm talking about is largely the States, but I would say that within academic spheres, there's more awareness for sure, but within the general public, I don't think it's changed very much. I don't think it's changed very much. Um, I remember once saying to somebody that I was working on something with uh, about Arab feminism, and she launched into this whole, I mean, she said, yes, yes, I know those poor women, they have nothing, they can't speak. You know, they're silent. Mm -hmm. Like, no, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. so. Right. Yeah. yeah. So it continues so, to be. Um, it continues to be uh, an issue. I think it's issue. better now. There's much more of a, of a textured debate now. Um, but, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah. So my next question. As already stated in my introduction, um, in 2008, you received the prestigious Del Sol Press Poetry Prize for your poetry collection, Geographies of Light. 
Um, apart from the topics of identity and belonging, many of the poems are about memories of places and of uh, people and return. Um, in fact, these notions are already addressed prominently in the book's title and also in the epigraph uh, taken from Constantine Kavafi's poem Isaka, uh, which says, wise as you have become with all your experience, you will have understood the meaning of an Isaka. Uh, maybe you can tell us a bit about these notions and the allusion to uh, Kavafi. Yeah, okay. Um, well... I have to say that the 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 Kavafi quote is very personal, and actually, you, you by asking the question, you've made me think about it in different ways. But um, that quote is very important to me. When I met my Greek Cypriot husband in AUB, he was an engineering student, and he introduced me to the work of Kavafi, which I didn't know, and he gave me a copy of the poem Ithaca, um, and that was kind of also always our touchstone uh, poem. Um, but it ties very strongly into my whole life and my work. Um, memory is, is at the heart of most of my creative writing. Um, and it ties in with the concept of Palestine because in memory we return. And in Palestine we seek to return. Um, and through memory I tried to make sense of my identity. I, I, I used to think that People who just had a, a stable identity were lucky because they could just get along with their lives. Um, but for me, even, even the concept of rebellion was difficult because it was harder to rebel against things that I found difficult in my family or in, my, in the culture around me because I wasn't on stable ground. I couldn't even claim it. You have to claim it in order to, in order to rebel against it. Um, and so memory gives you the chance to go back and find those pieces and build your foundation. So memory is very important to me. Um, and it, what I took from Kavafi is this sense of the journey. Um, and it ties in also very strongly with me for, um, in terms of Palestine, um, because if we're only focused on the end point and we don't ever get there, we've lost our lives. Um, and in terms of Palestine, you know, Palestine is disappearing. Um, but this whole concept of we have a goal, we know it's there, but there's a, there's a way to sort of take what the journey gives us. And, and poetry has given me that, actually. Even when you think about the way a poem is written, um, it's you don't write a poem to like tell us what it says. What what the, what the message is? If you wanted to say the message, you could just put it into an Correct. you know yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. you know right. a poem is in the making of the poem. A poem is in the language. It is in the turns. It is in the illusions. It is in all the sensory perceptions, um, and memory is what gives all of these things to me. So and memory creates these incredible layered linkages that help create who we are as people. So I mean, for me, I can walk here in the landscape of Cyprus, and there's so many points of resonance with the landscapes of my childhood. Oh. Um, and so every little thing will set off, set off a trigger or a cascade of, 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 of resonances. Mm -hmm. um, and all of these things will then come together from the past into the present. Um, and it also is what makes it possible to go on living, I think. Right. Um, because we find, I mean, my book is called Geographies of Light. Um, and part of it is because I realized, when I wrote these poems individually, I did not think I was writing a book. I did not imagine at the time that I could write a book. Um, and when I put them together, I began, I mean, a lot of the poems are about difficult things, painful things, but memory also gives us the long view and we realize mm -hmm. the, the landscapes that we've gone through um, and we realize the light that there is. And, and poetry, through its attention to detail and through its attention to fragility, um, can can resurrect even the most difficult experience, actually, I think. Um, in, in this context, it is again interesting to return to the essay you published in Meridians, yeah. um, in which you combine the notion of memory mm -hmm. uh, with that of transformation and the future. Um, now you've also introduced the term journey, but yeah. um, maybe this is uh, still a, a slightly different um, uh, focus. So could you possibly talk a bit about that? Yeah. Um, you know, when I wrote that essay for Meridians, um, I mean, it was an essay about Palestinian American writing and the concept of return. Um, and there's this, there's this tension about 
return because it's on the one hand, it's literal. I mean, Palestinians in exile want to be able to go home. It's also metaphorical, but time goes in one direction. Um, and memory is not nostalgia. Actually, I want to say this. Um, nostal I mean, nostalgia is, you know, we long for something in the past, and that past stays static. Memory is something different because memory is also a journey. We, we go back to the past and we bring it back into the present. So there's this kind of forward mo motion with memory. It's not actually getting stuck in the past, which is sometimes what people think it is, I think. Um, and I think when I think about my academic work and my creative work and also the issue of Palestine, um, what's necessary on all levels is transformation. I mean, the reason feminism is so important is because we're trying to transform societies and relationships. Um, in Palestine, we need to transform what is a terrible, unjust situation. In Arab American spaces, um, there is this, there has been this um, need to transform how we understand identity, how we understand community. Um, just briefly with Arab American issues, um, the first immigrants who came tried very hard to acclimate, to acculturate. Be the laws were changed, and there was a, a, a huge break in how many immigrants were allowed into the country for, for quite some years. Mm -hmm. And people became more Americanized. Um, and then there was, in the literature, in the early literature, there's a sense of people going back and trying to figure out how to connect to this identity that they didn't really know very well. Mm -hmm. And then we had many new people coming and reinvigorating. But so there's and and there's been a tension also between the settled Arab Americans and the new Arab Americans and what does it mean to say that you're an Arab American and what is an Arab American space and and how should people identify, and all of this is really a discussion about transformation, mm -hmm. because in all cases the reality is that the past is the past, it, another continent is at a remove so like within the Arab American space people are trying to transform what it means to be American of Arab origin or Arab in the States. There's a lot of debates and discussion, and it's all about trying to live a more whole life. I think it, in all cases, it's about trying to be more, more whole, all of these struggles, uh, about how to be more human, how to live to our full human potential. Um, and all of these, because society and humans are very flawed, um, <laughs> all yeah. of it requires transformation. Yeah. So, yeah. And so it became a metaphor for me, as well as something literal. And in that essay, I talk about Suhair Hamad, who I mentioned before, this Palestinian-American writer. And she talks about wanting to return to a home where she never lived, mm -hmm. um, to something within her um, that needs to be transformed. Mm -hmm. um, and so... and and. In another, in an essay that finally got published recently, I talk about the idea of home space in Arab American writing, um, and home space requires transformation if it's going to be habitable, um, and especially as a as a woman writer, um, especially right. as an Arab, and especially as a woman, we have homes. We need home space, and we need to transform it so that it can hold all parts of ourselves. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's how those all come together. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Great. So, Fascinating. Yeah. So this is uh, already my last question then. Okay. Um, so might I close this talk with a question? What is Palestine to you now? Yeah. At this stage of your life after you've uh, yeah. you know done so much work, um, well, not only on Palestine, but negotiating your um, yeah. you know mixed identity, uh, your dual allegiances, your several allegiances. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's it's a very deep part of me. Um, I've now I no longer allow people to tell me I'm half Palestinian. I'm Palestinian and I'm American. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't. I shouldn't say allow, but in the sense I want. I I, I really I really became um, uh, because sometimes talking about Palestinian politics, people say, "Well, you're outside. You don't have the right to have a position," and it's oh. been a way. For you know to be discredited, actually things mm. for my activism to be just discredited. Mm -hmm. Palestine for me is a focal point. It's a locus point. It's where my father came from. My my grandmother's family was from Jaffa. My father was from Birzeit in Jerusalem. I have very strong memories of going to Palestine as a child. Mm -hmm. Palestine, such a deep part of me, um, also because it's such a symbol of of the struggle for 
simple humanity and simple justice. Um, I consider it a very commonplace, common sense issue. It's not as complicated as people think. I believe that if we applied common sense to it, um, all you have to do is ask yourself, would I be OK with this happening to me? And the answer is always going to be no. And then we could like figure out how to solve it so that we can just move forward from here. You can't go back to the past, but you have to move forward. So Palestine is a source of great pain to me because every day I read the news. A lot of my poetry comes out of reading the news and being so deeply wounded because these, thing, these things are happening to people that I feel connected to on some deep level. Um, and I can't do anything about it except write or speak. I can't, I, you know, so difficult to do something about it. Um, but Palestine is also, it's also a joy. I mean, I connect to the landscape of Palestine. I mean, some of my earliest memories are of just being in Palestine. I remember when I was a child, um, we were there for a family visit and we went with my father and we drove through the countryside and we stopped and he was talked by there was a stone fence and he was talking to some farmer and when i went back home i drew a, a, i painted the picture of this stone fence and my teacher asked me about it he was a palestinian um and i said you know this is palestine and i'll never forget it i was quite young at the time he patted me on the shoulder and he said you love palestine oh and I don't think I really understood what that meant as a child, but somehow it went inside of me. So I think Palestine, re re uh, uh, Palestine symbolizes to me also the kinds of connections that we can have with the places that we come from and the landscapes that we live in. And it's symbolic. For me, it's, it's Palestine because it's closer to where I grew up and because I'm so connected to the justice issues. Um, and my connection to the states is also very personal, but then I've got this whole thing about you know the global superpower doing terrible things in the world. So, um, but, um, so it's kind of at the heart of who I am. Um, and for me, Palestine also, it symbolizes anguish and despair, but it's also a, a focal point of, of hope. It has to be hope, otherwise mm -hmm. there's nowhere to go. And it also symbols, symbolizes the need for transformation, home space and transformation at the same time. So I think that's a wonderful way to, uh, <laughs> to close this interview on the, no, on the uh, notion of hope and uh, transformation. So yeah. I would like to thank you very, very much, uh, Lisa, for okay. um, agreeing to do this uh, interview and for sharing your uh, ideas and some of your poetry with, uh, with our audience. And um, I would like to thank our audience for joining us. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye.